a lot of people want to go to, to you know, like Suboxone or these other drugs that help you wink off shit. Nah, fuck that. You know, like I'm, I'm like the kind of guy. It's all or none. Like I want to be popping those suckers like Skittles, or I don't want nothing. Just a group of guys just hanging out, just having fun, enjoying each other's company, and really just enjoying custom cars, man. I mean, old cars, new cars, whatever. We just we just like to go to car shows, hang out, go cruise, we go drag racing, we talk shit to each other, and you know, we never thought it was gonna be anything big, or at least I didn't think it was gonna be anything big. I was just doing it just to have fun, and and uh, it always kept me out of trouble. You know, instead of going to hitting the bars on a Friday, Saturday night, I went to Nathan's shop and we wrenched on cars, talked shit, went drag racing. Simple as that. You kind of involved into what it is naturally. Um, you know, I was racing dirt bikes at the time, going to school. As soon as I kind of transferred out of racing and started doing this, kind of for fun, you know, just, you know, doing some buddies' cars and then it just kept going and going and it finally just, once this patina thing hit, like, I never veered from that. I knew it wasn't where the money was, but it's what I liked. So, you know, I was just building, like, building cars for whatever somebody could afford to pay me. I mean, it's, I just wanted product on the street that people could see, basically, you know. I mean, cars had to be out there to spread the, the, the business and the brand. And Didn't have the money. I was a teacher. I'm working at a school, and uh, I kept bugging him about building a frame for me. And um, I knew I probably couldn't afford it, but Nathan was like, hey man, I'll put you on a payment plan. He put me on a payment plan. And I came and visited him every month, you know, just say hello, bring him a couple of dollars. Once I started getting this, once the patina thing hit, I mean, it just, like I was building so much shit. I don't even know how many cards I've built on myself. I mean, we all had a passion for it. And honestly, we didn't give a shit if it was gonna work or not work, or if it was gonna turn into anything big or not big, it was just, you know, it was just a passion for it. I mean, this place has grown. Um, it, it's incredible. 
what this place has become. I mean, and, but then you start looking at his hot rods and you start seeing what we do with these things. And, oh well, yeah, I mean, this is, he builds hot rods. You can, you can drive them every single day. Next thing you know, I mean, he's, you know, one of the, the builders in America that everybody knows. I mean, I've been out to California to visit my buddy and stop by a bar out there that was kind of a hot rod bar. And man, I, I was like a celebrity walking in that place whenever I told him that, you know, I had a, a 49 Chevy pickup that was gold and it was built by Hell Speed Shop. I mean, everybody stopped what they were doing and it was, oh shit, you, you have that gold truck. Oh, you were the one that had that Hell Speed Shop truck. And I mean, it was, you know, I was kind of astounded at the time because I thought, damn, I guess that was whenever it kind of came to me that, man, maybe we made an impression on people. Hey, <laughs> this has gotten a little bigger than we ever expected it to be. Nathan and I have pretty much been together our entire life. Um, he's six months older than I am, and we both grew up in Louisville. Our families are really close. Every day we're together. Every day we would go eat lunch together. I mean, even as we got older, if one of our moms caught us doing something, well, I mean, the other one's right around the corner. We're just we're just hiding, waiting for them to leave. You know, so <laughs> we've always been together. We kind of grew up in a neighborhood where it was a little older style. Kids were still able to play on the streets and ride dirt bikes, go-karts, all that stuff around the block. None of the neighbors ever complained or anything. He had a big, steep driveway at his house and we used to, to get on anything with wheels that we could go fast down the driveway and try not to kill ourselves. Nathan, growing up, he was, uh, he was, kind of mechanical minded and he liked to ride cycles. So Nathan rode motorcycles, dirt bikes and raced. And he was real good at racing, riding the dirt bikes. And he was, he's a, a well hard working young man and he still works hard. I mean, I, I credit all of my success to, you know, watching him and his work ethic and teaching me at a, at a young age, kind of a, a role model to look up to. We both came from you know the same background and seeing how hard he worked for something that he wanted um, was just a great example for me growing up. Moto is in your blood, you can't escape it, you can't, I mean, if there was a way I could make money on dirt bikes right now, that's what I'd be doing. I mean, I, that stuff's to my core. I mean, I love it. Every experience, every thing that made me who I am come from motocross. I mean, from roaming the country with my dad in a box van to, you know, taking off by myself when I, you know, was doing it for money. I remember my dad getting me a, like a PW80. We started, you know, he started taking me riding. He was still riding at the time, you know, so we would go riding, trail riding, you know, we wasn't going to the tracks or anything like that, but there was a few places around here that we'd go ride and um, that I still take my boys to today. It's pretty fun. Uh, but as I got more serious about it, my uncle bought me uh, this little piece of shit, you know, CR60. We didn't have any money, so like, I got, I even asked my dad to this day, I was like, how did we even afford to get to the races, you know, I mean, just, and uh, so Keith, my uncle Keith, shows up with this little Honda 60. I mean, I was stoked, you know, I didn't care what it was. It, looked, it, was, it was a dirt bike, a new one to me. So that's where the, the 27 comes from. That was my uncle's racing number when he raced. So since he bought me my first race bike, you know, more or less, it, what I went to the races on for the first time, that's why I ended up with number 27. Track this side of the jungle with no source or control. Saying, Lord, save your soul. If this heaven show you proof, hell's the only thing you know, man. You've been fly, you've been broke. You Years later, kept going and 
you know, got more and more serious about it, started getting more help, more sponsors, kind of escalated to where it was and um, started traveling a bunch, you know, me and the, all the moto crew, you know, like there's people come from all over the country that would connect at these big races, you know, from all over. I mean, from East Coast to West Coast, North to South, you know, I mean, these certain few races were like in our contracts that we had to race as amateurs. And, you know, so we all went, had to go to these races. And, you know, shit, man, that's some experiences right there, you know, that, that, you know, not necessarily good or bad, but it's shit that most people don't go through. You know, I mean, I was in Vegas at 15, you know, getting, a, <laughs> getting, you know, strippers in the dang <laughs> hotel room, you know, at 15 years old. I'm like, what is going on here? You know, there's, I remember that, that chick walking in, there's like 18 of us in there trying to round up enough money to pay her. <laughs> Seventeen, eighteen. You know, I took off me and a mechanic, and we just drove around hitting races, and you know, keep you know pushing, trying to get picked up by something that I could do better on. You know, better equipment, better bikes, and you know, I raced the big boys and did well, did really well. Was you know, really good guy in Texas. I mean, I trained hard. Like, I mean, even through high school, like beginning of high school, is when I got my first kind of my factory support. That was my ninth grade year because I remember I snapped my le I snapped my leg that year, both bones, man. I got T-bone right in the side and just and it broke both bones in this leg right in half. It looked like just snapped so fast that I didn't even know it happened. I just kept riding, like I mean not for long. Obviously it was apparent something was wrong pretty quick. But uh, but like as a motocrosser you're like no nah, it ain't broken. Fuck it I can keep going. Like I don't feel no pain. I don't. Because breaking bones sucks. Like, you know, we don't care about the pain or this or that. We're just like, man, it's six, eight weeks before I can get on a dirt bike again. You know, you can heal up. I want to go ride. I live a lifetime every moment when I'm holding you close. Lay your head down on my shoulder. Honey, I won't ever let go. Nathan and I met in December of 1999, officially. Um, we went to a Kid Rock concert together. So you have to think, I was 14 the night of this concert, and the, I was so excited when Rachel called and <laughs> asked me to go. And I said, is your hot cousin gonna be there? I'll never forget. I mean, it was a conversation 14-year-old girls were having, and she said, oh yeah, he's gonna come. So fast forward, the night goes on, we're in this concert, and the chaos leaving the concert was kind of crazy. And he held my hand the whole way out, and it all of a sudden felt like he was, he was protecting me and making sure, you know, this girl was gonna get out of this concert okay. And Give me deja vu, like I've been waiting my whole life to find that you. When I'm looking at your eyes, I go from California to Timbuktu, back to dancing in the living room. If I got you, baby, every day's a honeymoon. He was a senior in high school and I was a freshman. He called me and we went on our first date. <laughs> My mom takes us because she's not okay with me going out with a 17-year-old man. She takes us, we get in the back of her Tahoe, and Nathan is the best sport. And I had to tell my dad about this person, this man that I was quickly falling in love with. So a month later, we turned 15 and 18, and I think that's about the time I told my dad about Nathan, and everybody kind of was okay with him. We didn't see each other a lot. Um, he was racing dirt bikes every weekend. It was back when we didn't have cell phones yet, so he would page me um, whenever he could talk and we would talk on the phone a little bit and email a little bit. and We fell in love like hard and fast and I broke his heart a couple times. <laughs> I just did. It was hard for me at the age of 15 and 16 to think I loved him so much. 
and that I was gonna marry this man, and, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> but I had to figure out if that was really, really meant to be. I went to Oregon. We drove up there to race a, at that time, it was called a four-stroke national. And my cousin TJ, it was, a, it was a day of his birthday. I'll never forget it because for the past like four years leading up to that day, somebody has died on his birthday. And the race happened to be on his birthday. So I was mentally psyched, you know. I was, if you're close to TJ, it's gonna be your turn sooner or later. You know, so I guess that day was my turn and it was the first lap of practice. The track was sloppy and I was just like, just, I mean, we practiced the day before, but the track was, they really watered, real slick. So I was just like cruising and I getting a feel for it, you know, checking out the traction and I hear these dudes behind me, like first lap, just blasting. So I was like, I got like, there's a big old jump. Like I'm gonna have to jump this thing. This dude's gonna land on me. Man, I, I got seat bounce this jump and lose, it's so muddy, I lose all traction. Dude, it, it threw the nose down, so like split second, I was like, I got a bell. So I'm three stories in the air already, probably, and I just jump off the front of it, and I have to. I mean, I'm endo and so bad, so just hits, I mean, I just collapsed when I hit the ground. So I remember laying there in the track and just trying to just crawl off. I mean, I don't know what's wrong at that point. I mean, I know I'm broke up pretty good. And the next bike that I thought was gonna hit me, well, <laughs> shit you not, man, that bike comes in, I'm laying kinda in the track, just trying to crawl off, and that bike cases me. One wheel here, one wheel here, and I'm in the middle, and the thing just smashes me. Just 220 pound motorcycle. I can tolerate pain, but that was a pain above pain, you know? I mean, driving 30 hours back to Dallas from Oregon, beat up, broke up, and peeled up. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's really probably where that, you know, I say addiction, dependency, whatever comes in. You know, I was, for that injury, I was on pain meds for so long that um, I never quit taking them. I didn't think a whole lot of it at first because that's kind of our society. You know, you start hurting, you go to the doctor and they, and they give you the pain pills and, and you, you start feeling better. And, and I, I knew he was, I knew he was on them, um, knew he was taking them, but I had been around him for so long. I mean, it's one of those things when, when you grow up with somebody um, and you're with them every single day, you kind of become numb to the changes that they make. You don't see them, you know? It's kind of like uh, being away from somebody for so long, and then you come back and boom, they changed. You know, it's, you know, it's like overnight change. I didn't see that with him, you know? He was, I knew he was taking them. I knew, uh, I knew he was, you know, getting them from more people than his doctor. I knew he was, you know, probably taking more than he should, but, that surely they can't be that bad if he's taking them. You know, the doctors prescribe them. I knew he took them every day. I knew he took them multiple times a day. I probably knew he took them as much as he did, but I just didn't want to deal with it. I didn't know how to. There was nothing wrong with us, so I didn't think anything was wrong with him. And there was. They took over. They took over, they changed his personality, and I accepted it. Being dependent on that stuff, I couldn't just quit. The body can't just quit taking it. I didn't think I was hooked on them. I, I liked them, so I didn't know that where it was going to lead, you know, so cut to five years later, you know, still on the shit. Obviously, the, the body builds up a massive tolerance against it. So you just keep taking more and more and more. And I knew that it was a problem, like, but I couldn't go through the withdrawals right then and there. You know, I just, just had my firstborn. I mean, the shop was going, 
just, I didn't have a choice. I mean, I just kept, you know, I didn't have a, I couldn't burden my family. And I never did. Like it, you know, I always explain to people, you know, there's, there's junkies and addicts and there's dependents. Um, I depended on them to function at 100%. And probably wasn't truly 100%, but I depended on it to, to function. I mean, it's a physical, it's not a mental thing. It's a, really a physical addiction. And it kind of, you know, over the years, you know, it kind of just takes your edge off just a little bit more and more and more. I wasn't doing it to get high. Like, I was doing it just to, like, be normal. Like, the high was long gone for me. Like, that was when we were taking them and partying in our 20s, you know? I mean, taking them for, you know, two or three nights here and there, then we'd run out and that'd be it. You know, we would, that was all we'd get, so. There was many nights, you know, that, like, I'm laying there in bed thinking, you know, while I was still on this fucking dope, thinking, man, my breathing's like, tight I can't hardly breathe so you don't go to sleep like that if you have that feeling on opiate based drug you don't go to sleep and I, I remember laying there many nights before I quit thinking man I did too much today oh I hope I wake up tomorrow you know and you know once you start thinking those kind of things you know and you, you, your wife's laying next to you and you, your son's in the, in the room you know around the corner you're like ah, enough of this bullshit you know so and I, I, I know it's like, I know it's a problem. I was like, man, how am I gonna get off these things? Like, I, I remember thinking I just can't, I'm gonna take them the rest of my life, you know? But the older I got, you know, my kids and this and that, and, and the, the government finally started tightening up, which was a great thing, because it made me be like, whoa, these are harder to get. Like, I can't support, like, this is not a drug that you go, backwards you just keep up in it you don't go backwards so once they started getting harder to get i was like man this ain't good i got i gotta do something i don't know what clicked at that moment but something clicked and he realized he had to get off the pain pills and it was time to move on figure out how to be the best version of himself he could be without them and we cried in the bathroom together he talked me through it. So I just cold turkeyed the shit. I mean, literally, like I had one pill left. I mean, I remember like this is my last night <laughs> of sleep. Like it gives me goosebumps thinking about it, man. It, like this is my last night before hell starts. And I shit you not, hell started the next day. And I always knew he took a lot, but I don't, know if I just kind of turned a blind eye to it. I probably did. Because he was still always there for me. He was always there and supported us. So when I would see him struggling with that addiction, I just knew I had to be all in as he was ready to get off of them. So this was like 12 years on this stuff, pretty hardcore. Like 12 years of taking this you know, opiate-based drug to finally realizing, oh man, you know, this is, this ain't right. So yeah, that, that last pill, man, like I think I might have saved it for a couple of days before I took it because I knew that was, you know, hell, it was gonna go bad, you know. I, I knew I could get through it. Um, you know, like I said, when I, I, I told my wife, uh, and she knows if I tell her something, that I ain't going back, you know, like we have that much trust in each other that if I don't lie to her, she don't lie to me. So if I tell her something, it's sticking. The focus was hard to maintain at first. That's what was really hard to maintain was staying focused because, I mean, your body is freaking out. I mean, it is literally, I mean, you can look like, you can look at your chest and you can see your heart thumping. I mean, it's just everything is getting woke back up again. 
um, trying to reset. This is a tunnel most don't come back from. You know, it, it normally leads to a gun to the head, so. I have a fear of being a widow. My mom was a widow at a very young age. And that's always in the back of my mind. What happens? What happens to us? You know, to, to dig my way back out of it was, you know, to me, you know, why, why do I come across as cocky? Well, I tell you what, anybody that can get through that, they deserve to be cocky. Because, like, I, I came off of it and nobody even knew the difference. I didn't go to rehab, I didn't do nothing. You know, cold turkey it, manned up and took care of my shit. You know, I didn't have any other option. I had to. So, you know, I mean, but. The nights were bad, man. I mean, like I said, I had to keep moving forward. You know, I've already, I'd already worked too hard. I've already, you know, you know, punished myself to, to get this business going and to build cool hot rods. So throwing in the towel, that just wasn't an option. He told me that, you know, I'm out. I don't have any more. And I'm not going back to the doctor. I'm not going to buy any more. I'm done. And I said, okay, what do I need to do? Just hold on, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. It was real bumpy, but we made it. And I didn't know exactly how hard of a time he was having until, until this project started coming up and, and he started telling me, you know, and, and some of the stuff that he had went through. And, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of one of the sides you never see of somebody, regardless of how close you are, which you keep, you, you just don't see that side of him. And, and me being away from him for as long as I have and then I came back, I mean, seeing how he is now, it's, it's awesome. And it's crazy to say, but I wouldn't change anything because it's made him who he is today. It's probably why our relationship is as strong as it is. And not probably, it is. But I wouldn't change our story. I love it. Anybody that's addicted to this stuff, I tell you, like, you don't think it's ever gonna end because it's, it's not something that, you know, you get through the withdrawals where the body's kinda working normal again, but the brain ain't healed. And that's, that's another thing I, you know, that my doctor warned me about. He goes, you're, you're not gonna feel right for like two years. Like, for as long as I've been on it, it took, it took two to maybe three years for me to be me again. Like, this don't, it ain't overnight. It's like I said, anybody that's, that is on it or for your young kids that, you know, that are moto kids that get hurt, that get injured, you know, try Advil first. <laughs> don't, don't go straight to, you know, opiate-based painkillers, that's for sure, because once, they, once that stuff sinks its teeth in you, you know, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm mentally strong and it grabbed me, dude, and, and reeled me in. I was hooked. Jenna pulled me through it, man. Without her, there was, I mean, she's the only person that knew what I was going through. Nobody else even knew. Not my parents, not, you know, like I said, I, I woke up and took care of my shit, you know. Most of these guys are checking into rehab three, four times for, and they, they still don't get off of it, you know. It's, like I said, I'm not really telling this for the people that are on them now because most of you ain't got the strength to get off of them anyway. I'm just, you know, this is more about the younger generation of me that I don't want them to go through that. I wish nobody to go through what I went through. I mean, that was from that last pill to being happy naturally was a, a four year process. Here we are four or five years later and he's clean, sober, and he's my Nathan, he's back. I didn't know I lost him. I'm finally back, you know, it's me, it's, it, I'm clear headed, I'm focused. You know, I know where I wanna go, I know where I wanna take this stuff and, you know, and, and you know, like there's nobody that can abuse me or induce as much pain as I put on myself through that. So, you know, like, I'm kind of glad that I went through it, you know, it, it, mentally it made me a bad motherfucker. I mean, just because to go through that 
and come out of it, man, I mean, that's a blessing. You know, most people don't ever get off that stuff. I mean, they take it till the day they die. He came back to me slowly, and at the time, you know, between maybe 25 and, and 30, I don't know if I realized how much of him was gone. It just had become the new normal. And then he came back, and that's probably when we became even more close. This is Colin's second one, and for this one to be possible, you got to go back to the blue one, which uh, he put in a guardrail, smashed it all to hell. And the weird story is, you know, when I was building that car, I actually built it for a um, a family, and it's going to be a girl's high school car, her first car. And uh, during the build process, man, I just I took a hit to the face with a grinder and it slipped me all open and knocked teeth out. So whenever uh, he originally started building the Blue Bel Air, the patinaed one for a customer at the time, and I had that gold 49 Chevy pickup that, uh, man, I, uh, I love that truck to death, but the first time I came by his shop and saw that Bel Air not even complete sitting in front of his shop, I was like, damn dude, you know, you need to call that customer up see if he wants to sell that car. I'll, I'll sell my truck in a heartbeat to buy that car. They actually, I finished the build and the family took it and drove it for a while. And um, you know, some way, somehow they needed to sell it. So I bought it back and um, I never buy them back. Like I said, that car just, it, it, it was a life changer for me. So I did buy it back. I go down to his shop and that car's sitting there at his shop. And I was like, damn, did the customer finally bring it back to finished it up and he said no I bought the car and I was like well shit if you bought the car then you gotta sell it to me man I bugged him every single day that I was at the shop telling him sell me the car just I'll sell my truck I'll put it on eBay right now just sell me the car I was like all right man fine if you want the car I'll sell it you know basically what I got in it he kept it for a while and uh, I shit you not I mean he he got a little crazy and put it in the guardrail, I mean, just totaled it. So that's where this car comes into play, you know, and we had already planned on a big group of us going to the Lone Star Throwdown. So I was like, man, I can't let Colin down. Like, I was like, he's got to go still. I was like, well, find me a car, man. I said, if you find me a car within a month, I'll get it built. Whatever it takes, I'll do it. I'll get it built. I knew I wanted another 54 Bel Air and I started looking. I tried to find a patinaed one, and uh, man, these things are hard to find patinaed anymore. Still had stitches hanging out of me, but was convinced that I'm, we're building another car, that's it. And all of a sudden, I uh, was on Craigslist, and I found a, a 54 Bel Air gloss black. You know, the guy said his wife didn't want to sell it anymore, and so I thought, well, I understand the guy's got a sentiment to it, so I'll just buy the sentimental gene out of him. So I called him back, or no, I didn't even call him. I, I texted him. It was just a one-line text with an offer, and that was it. And I think two days later, the guy texted me back and said, yep, we'll sell it. But anyway, I calculated, I had 25 days, like, and I calculated the hours. I was like, okay, so I can sleep for roughly two hours a night, you know, because I still spend an hour a day with my kids. I wasn't going to give that up. So, you know, if you count showering and this and that, maybe not like hour and 30 minutes a night, you know, by the time it was all said and done. So um, 25 days straight, you know, roughly 21 hours a day, built this car, um, just blasting pink, you know, the whole time. All we can think about is just getting this thing done for the Lone Star Throwdown. But we ended up getting it done in time. I mean, it was a lot of long hours, late nights, fucking knuckle busting work, but we got it all done in time. And I mean, we didn't even have a chance to test drive the car. We didn't even take the damn car around the block even for uh, a minute. We just finished up the car, filled it up, and 
drove it down to fucking Conroe, just north of Houston. And that made for an awesome first test drive with the car. We all took off to Conroe and I'll never forget this little video I had that Jenna took that it was Colin and Leah just cruising past me in it. and I was like, oh man, that made it all worth it to see, you know, them just rolling it down the highway, having a blast, like that, that that's all I needed, you know, that's what I did it for. It was worth it after that. And, and going back to the blue, you know, the blue 54, that was the trigger for me. Like that car, that's why I bought it back. I mean, because when I, when I got injured on that car, and took that grinder to the face that, I remember sitting there in the uh, ER getting sewn up thinking, man, this got to be a, like, a sign or something, you know, it's just time for a lifestyle change, you know, so. I mean, that, that's why that Blue 54 is kind of special to me, you know, and, and the, the family I bought or was building it for originally was an awesome family that, the, you know, I enjoyed working with them. And, and when they told me they needed to sell it, I was like, yeah, I want it. You know, that car changed my life. I mean, it literally changed my life. I mean, it took me from, if that injury wouldn't have happened, I don't know that I would have quit, you know, because like, well, I got to quit dipping snuff. I got to. I just, I just quit all of it, you know, screw it, you know, so like I said, I just cold turkeyed everything. I mean, from energy drinks to, to snuff to nicotine to, you know, painkillers, just cold turkey and, and dealt with it. I think it's time to put them in a place. I'ma have to set them straight. You don't know me. You don't know where I'm from or what I had to do to get this plate. Hey, let me paint a picture. Everybody dissing, acting like it wasn't cool to listen. Now look at me. I say now look at me. Let me get it started. So I met Nathan in a roundabout way. Um, you know, working a lot. I don't get out to a lot of shows, so my avenue for for seeing what's out there is social media and the same truck kept popping up on social media and it was a bare metal big window uh, late 50 Apache that Nathan had built and I I didn't really know Nathan at the time I just knew him of the cars he was building um, and that particular truck I would message the owner Caleb and you know tell him that I had interest in the truck I really liked it he was driving the the hell out of it supercharged it was really cool and you know, he kept saying, oh, I can't sell that truck. I'm, I'm just not interested in selling. I kept up the conversation with Caleb and one day he said, you know what? Uh, I think I'm ready to sell the truck. Uh, you know, can we talk numbers? So we just sat down, discussed, uh, discussed over the phone and came up with a number and pulled the trigger. He come down here all excited. <laughs> said, man, I got this much money for the truck. I was like, okay, that ain't gonna build you shit. What do you, I mean, that wasn't enough. Why'd you sell it? And uh, so he calls and wires the money back to him. <laughs> so anyway, that's how that started. And that was uh, the original Apache I built. He ended up sending that to me since Caleb didn't want to sell his truck after we had about a 30 second conversation. He was already like, oh no, backpedaling, you know, thinking, okay, this wasn't a good idea. So. So he called me at an evening and I thought it was about to finalize the deal on the truck and he, he flipped the switch on me and said that he's really having seller's remorse and that he can't sell me the truck. Um, and it kind of struck me off guard um, and he agreed to send me my money back and I said, you know, that was fine because he seemed like a nice guy and I can really uh, relate to getting rid of something you really enjoy. Um, you know, and then in trade and understood, I was probably a little upset, said, well, how about I get you set up with Nathan? You, you can build your own truck and you can go from there. Um, and at the time I didn't really know Nathan, but I figured I would, uh, take him up on that. I didn't have a lot to go off of Nathan. I never met the guy, barely talked to him. And uh, you know, the next step in this process for me to send him basically a blank check in, in, a, in a truck and hope it turns out. You know, at that point, I didn't have a truck in mind um, in terms of, of which truck we were gonna build. Being that I just got over Caleb's big window fleet side Apache, 
the hunt started for that particular truck. I located a truck in Arizona, never saw the truck, sent it blindly to, to Nathan, and uh, you know, throughout the process of that truck, I'd never seen the truck or Nathan. As I saw progression on the truck, I instinctively started looking for the next one. You know, before the, the Apache was done, I had already found the next project, um, a 59 Buick. Uh, and the way that it worked out, as the Apache came off the trailer, the Buick went on. And uh, it was one right after another, no pause. Um, and, and I knew as that Apache came off the trailer, I was making the right decision by sending him the, uh, the 59 Buick. As the Buick is underway, you know, uh, a weight is relieved off my chest and, and I'm out there looking for the next one. Uh, the next one came from, uh, from a barn in Northern California, um, the GMC. It, it started out as a, as a boom truck used to lift bales of hay out of a field and, and that was uh, the last use for it. Once the Buick showed up, the, uh, the GMC went right back down there. He's a one-man band and you know, from beginning to end it's Nathan's hands, which uh, you know, it has a lot to do with how these, these vehicles turn out, but the, uh, the truck itself pulled it off. Boost work, throttle work, brake check, everything was good and, you know, haven't had an issue with it since. The difference with Nathan is, is, is the builds speak for themselves, you know. The fact that Nathan can do all this without answering calls, without having a secretary, without having a sign on his door, you know, speaks volumes to, you know, the craftsmanship. The, the example that I tell everybody is there's very few builders, if any, that you could take seven cars, barrel down a Texas highway through a rainstorm, four hours later show up at your destination with zero issues, turn around to a show and haul ass back. I mean, that, that just doesn't happen with other builders. Um, and I was a part of that going to uh, Lone Star Throwdown. So not only can you tell that Nathan's a great guy and that he has um, you know, great work ethic, um, busts his ass, he's a one-man band, but it really shines in his, uh, his family values and, and really comes out in his, uh, his two boys. Uh, you can tell they are, I've spent some time with them in Nerf Wars and they are, uh, they are fun kids, crazier than hell, but uh, they, they, got, they have good values and you can tell they're going to turn out just to be like Nathan. You got one man building hot rods here and the way he builds them has not been duplicated. You can look at it and say, oh, that's easy, I can, I can do that. No, you're wrong. I know people have tried and, and they'll call him asking questions and he, he'll kind of laugh because he knows they're trying to, they, they've seen something on, on the internet so they're, they're trying to figure out what he does and they just can't make it work. So like my, my little inner loop, you know, is what I call it is, you know, is, is the guys like Sam, Colin, Scott, you know, um, TJ for sure, you know, TJ's been there since I started this thing, so he's seen this journey from the get-go. I mean, I've had a, you know, a couple of good guys that could do the work, and, but man, I just, I don't even think it's their fault. I think it's my fault that they can't work with me. I mean, it's just, I want stuff done a certain way, and, you know, I don't go by the, chassis book they wrote for the Model A, you know, so I'm like, I develop like my own way of doing it and a lot of people look at it like, no, that, that won't work, you know, that those angles won't work and I was like, oh yeah, okay, and just not, whatever, no, just keep thinking they don't work because then you won't ever try it, you know, keep going by your, you know, Barnes and Noble chassis for dummies book or whatever, you know, I don't know, <laughs> I mean, I just don't go by the book. I want to try stuff different that's out of the box. There's a reason why he's been doing this for as long as he has. 
and there's a reason why he's got a wait list that's three years long. He's a hot rod builder, but he's also an artist. You don't give an artist something and tell him, hey, I want you to paint this. Like, no, that ain't how it works. He builds them how he wants to build them. And if you can't go by that, he ain't gonna build you a car. But one thing I can promise you, for as long as I've been around him, there, there has never ever been anybody that's been unhappy with their car. When they get it, it's always a lot better than whatever they had in mind because they watched something on TV. I've known Nathan Hill for about 15 years. Met him at a good guy show in Dallas, Texas called the Lone Star Nationals. And man, um, it was a pleasure to meet him, meet his family, meet all of his friends, and was surprised that he is a sleeping giant. Like, I do this every day, seven days a week, at least 15 hours a day for the past 10 years. I love getting in my hot rod and cruising around, so do other people, you know, so it's, it's a rewarding job, you know, and it's, it's something that I can do that, that I don't have to have nobody in my ear telling me what to do. I just do what I want to do and, and, you know, and my customers pretty much know that. Um, you know, I have a style that I go with and I don't veer from it. You know, if, if, if you don't like it, then, you know, go to some other shop and I'm sure they'll build it, you know. Yeah, I think people are waiting for Nathan to build him a hot rod because they know what they're getting. They know what's all involved and they can see it. Nathan builds things where you can see every aspect of the build, you know, with your own eyes. When you look down off in the motor compartment, when you look down at the back of the suspension, you can see the simplicity and how it works and how it can be taken apart and put back together. But it almost took a miracle to get it that way. He strived to be the best in the industry. He looked up as much and researched as much as he could and came up with his own way. And he strived to, to, to research enough to make, you know, make himself the best in the industry. Simple as that. And all these other people, if they're not the best in the industry, it's because they don't put in the time. My brother is Hell Speed Shop. There's no other, other way around it. Um, Hudson and Porter are so young still. Um, there would be no Hell Speed Shop if something happened to my brother tomorrow. Pack it up. We're done. Uh, with without without him with without the main without him running this place without him being around here doing what he does there is no hell speed shop he he is hell speed shop uh, and with if he's if I mean if anything ever happens to him it's it's over it's done he is hell speed shop so it's hard to say that anything would ever happen with it without him I mean. Nobody's going to be able to build chassis or cars like he will. I mean, shit, at that point, if something did happen, I'd want to try to help out his family as much as I could, money-wise or anything, you know, so. If something happens to me, uh, Jenna'd probably be better off, you know, hey, she, she but no, no, not really, but no, she has put up some shit, man. I mean, there's only probably one girl in the world for me, and it's her, you know, I mean, I'm the kind of guy that I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and. And she knows, like she gets that, you know, she trusts me. She knows I ain't out running around on her. No, I'm down here working, you know, that's, that's all I do. I work, I go home, I play with my kids. I work and anything I make, I give to them. I mean, I, don't, I mean, I got holes in my pants and shoes and, you know, like I said, I give it all to them. You know, I mean, that's, that's what I work for to give them the, the best childhood they can have. You know, I think it's super important, so. So as far as how long can I keep doing it, I mean, my dad's 60 something. He can go as hard as I can to this day. I mean, so yeah, as long as my heart keeps thumping, I think I can definitely do till 60 or 70 pretty hardcore. Tell me what your dad does. Do you guys know what he does for a living? Um, he works on the track all day, and we, um, for us to ride. Yeah? Speak really, really loud. 
Porter, what does your dad do? Mm, he works on the track. Yeah? What else? He builds cars for he, other people. He does? What kind of cars does he build? Hot rods. Hot rods. Hot rods. What kind of hot rods? Like really pretty, perfect paint? Yeah. Yeah? What no, else? it's all like rusty. Rusty, yeah. My dad's truck is rusty. Like your dad's truck? They're fast. How do you know they're fast? Because they're nitrous. They have nitrous? Yes. Really? Yeah. Which one of you guys was the one that did a burnout in your dad's truck? Me. You did it? I'm going to drive it. When? One when day. he's older. No, one day. But I'm going to drive it before you. No, I am. No, I am. I'm going to do a big burnout. No, I'm doing it. <laughs> you haven't even done a burnout yet. I know. So, Hudson, do you like hot rods? Yes. Why? Tell me what you like about them. Mm, they look cool. They're fast. Okay. Port, do you like hot rods? Yeah? You like to go fast? Which one of you guys likes to go fast? Me. Who likes to go fast more? Me! Me! <laughs> no! <laughs> Me! <laughs> Alright, come sit down. Come sit down. Sit over here, Port. So, who's better on a bike? back here. Me. Porter's pretty good too though. But I'm better. You're better? You don't even jump the rollers. You just go over them. You I can't jump. even jump that. I almost jumped it. So do you guys <laughs> want to build hot rods when you grow up? Yes. Yes I do. You want to build hot rods? Hudson, you want to build hot rods? Yes. Like your dad? I'm going to put nitrous on them. Nitrous? You want to put nitrous on your bicycle? Yeah. You can't put nitrous on your bicycle. <laughs> I can turn it on and beat Hudson on a race. No, you couldn't. Do you guys know what we're doing with your dad? What kind of movie we're making with him? Ah, uh, hot rod movie. Oh, that's right, hot rod movie. And a bicycle movie. And a bicycle movie. And Electric movie. bike movie. That's right, a movie about you guys. You guys want to ask me any questions? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, bud.